Thank you, Dr. Park. I hope that you are enjoying beautiful island of Jeju, Korea, and I welcome to uh, uh, welcome you to my country. It's always most difficult to be the last speaker because of PLF. You know what that is, right? Before lunch syndrome. But I'll try to keep you entertained for the next 30 minutes. Uh, so even though you have a hungry, hungry appetite, please uh, bear with me. I personally enjoy a lot uh, doing lateral window technique, ridge augmentation. However, my patients do not enjoy uh, when I do lateral window technique, as you can see here. And today I would like to share with you how we can simplify the sinus grafting technique so that you and the patient can enjoy at the same time. So when you have sinus uh, case like this, severely pneumatized, only one millimeter of initial bone height. Which approach would you take in your practice? I personally think that most dentists would take lateral window approach, correct? But isn't there an easier way to approach this? And I came out with my classification of sinus uh, and in my opinion, because of 3D comb beam CT scan, the width of alveolar bone plays greater role than the height of alveolar bone. Especially in class 2 defect, it is very important to open window through the crest, uh, such as in this case, rather than opening a lateral window in order to minimize morbidity to our patients. Uh, because whenever we raise big flat beyond mucogingival junction, going into basal bone, then patient tends to have more morbidity, pain, and swelling. And your patients will not enjoy the implant treatment. And because of improved surface, uh, I think short and wide implant is an excellent, excellent treatment of choice uh, for our patients, but it requires minimum, in my, in my dictionary, minimum of 6 millimeter bone height and greater than 12 millimeter of bone width. Now, when we have greater than 6 millimeter and uh, greater than, uh, less than 12 millimeter reach, then it is okay to do a blind technique because all we need to do is lift just a little bit uh, in order to uh, augment the sinus. However, in class four uh, morphology, uh, only techniques that will work is actually lateral window technique because uh, of severely pneumatized uh, sinus and uh, uh, very uh, thin ridge. So in this case, as I mentioned, I think the best approach for our patients is through the crest. Uh, I would like to make palato incision for many reasons. Uh, because we're making window through the crest, it is very important that we make palato incision uh, so that in case of perforation, you do not have a flap opening within your crestal window. So after small palato incision, we will utilize my improved version of sinus drill called sinus express burr because it will penetrate the bone, penetrate the sinus floor without perforating the schnadarian membrane. And by utilizing thinner and improved mushroom elevator, now you can access, you can initiate the membrane elevation, and with use of improved and thinner cobra instrument, we're able to lift the sinus from the crestal window and we can pack some putty bone to uh, fully elevate the sinus, as you can see on your left. So this technique is great because this is the only crestal approach that is not a blind technique. Every other technique that is out there is blind technique. Therefore, you have no idea whether you got perforation or not. But with this technique, it's not a blind technique. In case of perforation, at least you will know how to manage your perforation. Now, when you have severely pneumatized but pretty wide reach, I do not recommend to do a lateral window technique. Not because of morbidity, but because if the ridge is pretty wide, it is difficult to elevate the palatal wall. As you can see here, if the ridge is pretty thin, 
on the upper, upper, upper jaws, it is easier to fully elevate the palatal wall, but if the ridge is pretty wide on the bottom jaw, it is difficult to fully elevate the palatal wall. So, and there has been a recent study which shows that wider the ridge, the vital bone formation is much less, and the quality of bone formation that we get from these sinuses are much less compared to thinner ridges. And main reason for that is lack of ability to raise the palatal membrane. Because if you think about it, if the ridge is pretty wide, it would be very difficult to reach all the way to the palatal side. So second case I would like to share with you is a case that uh, a surgeon did a sinus lift about six months ago, uh, but unfortunately he did not lift all the way to the palatal side, and patient ended up with this type of bone augmentation. In this scenario, it is difficult to open lateral window now because the bone thickness is too thick. It will be very difficult to open uh, lateral window. How about crestal window? Well, because of very unpredictable irregularities, it will be very difficult to do crestal approach as well. So how can we salvage these type of cases uh, when patients present with 50% uh, uh, lateral uh, augmentation done? So after brainstorming, I decided to do palatal approach. So I raised the flap on the palatal side, and I made a small window. Thanks to a great Megagen's instrument, I was able to get access. Uh, if you imagine, palatal tissue is fairly thick, and it is very difficult to get nice access. But because we have very small, uh, well-made instruments, I was able to lift from the palatal side, and we were able to uh, augment the sinus from the palatal side, and we were able to put the implant at the same time. Now, I would like to talk about class 3 and class 2 uh, morphology. And before, really, my sinus kit was aimed to uh, be used with rescue implant, wide diameter implant. But now, the trend is to preserve the bone and going, going with much uh, a stronger connections, such as any ridge implant. And in order to adapt to a uh, new implant system, I had to come out with a smaller diameter uh, Sinus Express Burr, and I am very proud to announce that we have from 2.9 all the way to uh, 5.9 millimeter for the Crest approach. Now, using this burr, I named this Sinus Express because really it cuts the bone fairly fast and, and you can deliver the bone into the sinus very, very quickly. That's why I named this Sinus Express Burr. So let's look at the typical class 3 defect. We have a very uh, uneven sinus here. So we will set the stopper one millimeter longer than the uh, radiographic sinus. So if the radiographic sinus floor was five millimeter, all you need to do is set it at six millimeter. If the radiographic floor was seven millimeter, all you need to do is set it at eight millimeter. So really, sinus lift uh, technique has been very simplified. And all you need to do is really grind at 1,000 RPM with a lot of irrigation until you feel drop into the sinus, just like right now. You feel drop into the sinus, and that's an indication that you penetrate the sinus floor, and you shouldn't really rotate uh, when you're inside the sinus. However, um, we rotate it within the sinus for a few seconds. This Despite the fact that we were rotating at 1,000 RPM within the sinus, you can appreciate that the membrane was still intact. And why is this possible? Is this magic? No, this is because of simple physics. Pressure equals force divided by area. By increasing the surface area of the burr, we were able to minimize the pressure to the membrane. It's a very predictable uh, way to do a sinus lift. Uh, anything you put in into the sinus, because it is a well-contained defect, uh, you, it will take, so in this case, I just put uh, whatever I had in my practice, which ha happens to be Alloplast, and we place uh, three uh, implants uh, very, very quickly. So from beginning to the end, three implants plus the sinus lift took less than 15 minutes. And this is not good if you finish too quick, because patients do not want to pay. Let's talk about lateral window technique. 
So how can we make the lateral window technique less invasive? And the only way that I can make it less invasive is to make it so easy that anybody can open a lateral window in less than three seconds. I really mean less than three seconds. So personally, as I mentioned earlier, I enjoy doing lateral window technique because personally I think it is very exciting surgery. You can see the membrane moving up and down and it, it is really exciting and I enjoy a lot. But once again, patients do not enjoy. So using a beer bottle opener technique, you can simply just open the lateral window and anybody can open uh, in less than three seconds. If you know how to open a beer bottle, you will know how to open a lateral window. Uh, due to limited time, I will just share with you one lateral window case. This patient presented uh, in my clinic, I typically do not do a lot of lateral window because I can get I can do most of the techniques with my sinus express burr. But in this case, patient presented with the tooth inside the sinus. As you can see here, patient had a tooth inside the sinus, and only way to remove this tooth is to open lateral window. So I chose to do a lateral window technique using the trap find that I have illustrated to you. And my goal here is to remove the tooth and without making perforation in the membrane so that I can augment and place implant at the same time. So minimal flap is uh, mandatory for me to uh, make it as minimally invasive as possible. Uh, because my trap fines are fairly small, uh, mi minimal flap elevation is acceptable. After uh, making a trap fine indentation, and because this trap fine has a stopper, it is fairly difficult to cut all the way to the bone. And in fact, the role of this trap fine is just to uh, make a mark on the bone so that it weakens the bone. So that when you put the beer bottle opener, you can pop open the sinus wall. It's just like a Coca-Cola can. Coca-Cola can is pre-grooved. So when you push it in, what happens? You push in that metal part. So same idea. After we apply the trap fine, we will use the window opener as I have illustrated and this is the quickest and simplest way to open lateral window in less than three seconds. So you have to be careful to avoid uh, cutting the uh, intraosseous anastomosis of PSA artery and after elevation we found the tooth, uh, we removed the tooth and we elevate it all the way to the palatal side to maximize the blood supply to your bone graft. And I have used Megagen's uh, Bone Plus. Uh, because it's fairly well contained defect, 100% alloplast will be acceptable in this case. Uh, if it was a ridge augmentation case, I would recommend 50% uh, autogenous plus uh, alloplast. The bone that we took out from the original location Simply, I put it back to exactly the same location. So you don't have to put membrane over the window, and you can appreciate uh, the membrane mimics the uh, tooth morphology. And patient came back one year later, and he, she received the uh, implant crown. Uh, last case I'd like to share with you in terms of sinus will be another class 2 case uh, because I enjoy doing class 2. Uh, matter of fact, majority of the techniques that I utilize in my office will be a class 2 technique uh, because I do not want patients to end up looking like a chipmunk after one week. So in here, you would think that you would open a lateral window, correct? Because it's severely pneumatized and most people recommend lateral window technique whenever you have less than 5 millimeter bone height. But once again, most important aspect would be the width of the alveolar bone. If the width of the alveolar bone is pretty wide, why are we making lateral window? Why, are we making, why, why don't we make crest the window so that we can lift the sinus from the crest approach? So always in this type of cases, I always start with the mandibular surgery because by doing mandibular surgery, I can collect 
a lot of autogenous bone, and I, will, I, will, I have collected more than three cc's of autogenous bone from the mandibular uh, implant osteotomy site. So when I go to maxilla to do the sinus lift, once again, my uh, flap elevation is not beyond mucogingival junction, and it is very minimally invasive for the patient. I don't have to worry about the artery, and as you can see here, this is not a blind technique. This is like making uh, four small windows and using the specialized uh, birds, making this window should not take more than two to three seconds. And we will utilize the cobra instruments to fully elevate the buckle and the palatal wall. Once again, if the ridge is pretty wide, using the lateral window technique, it is very difficult to elevate the palatal wall, but because my window is at the center of the crest, it is equally easy to lift the palatal and the buccal uh, membrane. After membrane elevation, I will put some allograft in this case. After we put the allograft, I have uh, sutured the patient, but as you can see here, I have little worry. Because I have stabilized all this implant with just one to three millimeter of initial bone height, I recommend that patient not to wear any denture. And the patient said, are you crazy? I need my denture today. But I know that as soon as patient wears denture, this implant that I worked so hard to stabilize will go, in, go, go up to the sinus. Just like this case, patient wore a denture and implant was found under the orbit one week later. So I highly recommend the patient to be out of uh, denture, but he said, no way. I need my denture today. So what I have done is I utilized just any uh, mini implant. Uh, fortunately, patient had a tori, maxillary tori, and I put two implants on the front, and that was the beginning of my uh, journey in palatal implant stabilization, uh, and I have relined his denture to uh, uh, my uh, mini implants, and patient walked out with the denture on the same day. Fortunately, everything went okay, but there was two disadvantages to the system. Because only FDA approved mini implant is at least 10 millimeter in length, actually the implant came out through the nasal mucosa. It was too long. But because it was a temporary, it was acceptable because I was, plan I was planning to remove the implant. Number two, the attachment that I had was a ball ring attachment. Because it is a bowel ring attachment, every time patients swallow at night, because I instructed the patient to remove the denture, it bothered the tongue, and the tongue had an indentation. Every time he swallowed, the tongue was pushing on this implant, and it really made the tongue very, very uncomfortable. So, without this implant, I don't think this, this uh, permanent implant would have been integrated successfully. Uh, but because they held in place and retained the denture, uh, we were able to restore all the implants and patients were very happy. With help of uh, my mentor, Dr. Park, uh, we are proud to announce that we have uh, finally developed palatal denture stabilizer. I would like to talk about my palatal denture stabilizer because it plays a big role in my practice, especially when I do extraction. And when I try to deliver immediate denture, you know how sometimes that immediate denture does not fit? But by putting three or four uh, palatal implants, we're able to uh, stabilize any uh, denture that is loose. So as you can see from this video, every time we make, uh, we do a full mouth implant, we will grind the buccal flange, especially when we do GBR. And because we don't want that unwanted force on the, on, on the uh, buccal wall. And because we remove the buccal wall, buccal flange, it is difficult to stabilize the implant, uh, difficult to stabilize the denture. And by using this palatal uh, stabilizer, we're able to always obtain excellent initial stability. 
So let me go into detail in terms of how we can utilize this palatal uh, denture stabilizer. First, I highly recommend CT scan because everybody has a different morphology of palate. So we, you want to find the thickest area of the bone because more bone to implant contact you have, it will be more favorable for your patient. According to this study in, uh, published in Orthodontic Journal, the, the squares that are in white color, they found the most amount of bone, greater than six millimeter of bone height. So I recommend you to go into pre-maxillary region in order to engage maximum amount of bone. Uh, however, in this article, they, they do mention that there is great uh, uh, variability, inter-patient uh, variability, and they also recommend individual CT scan in order to uh, apply uh, this concept. But if you do not have a CT scan available, I recommend you to go between the canine and the first bicuspid region. So let me talk about surgical procedure. Uh, obviously, we, we do want to take a CT scan. Uh, to find the maximum amount of bone volume to be able to stabilize this implant. So this is my uh, CT scan here on your left. And after we take a CT scan, uh, you want to place this implant where you have the maximum amount of bone volume. But before I actually talk about surgical technique, uh, the characteristic of this implant uh, is very critical, and I would like to go into detail in terms of uh, the characteristic of this implant. Just like any ridge, initial stability is a must. So we have made taper design with knife thread so that we can maximize uh, initial stability and also increase bone to implant contact. Uh, in fact, this typical size that I use is three millimeter in diameter, five millimeter in length. The surface area of this three by five millimeter implant is exactly the same as a regular implant diameter of four millimeter and seven millimeter in length. So in terms of surface area, even though it's a small implant, because of knife thread design, it maximizes the surface area. Number two, because it is very pointy, 90% of the time, you do not require any drilling. All you need to do is just simply screw in, and surgical technique is very simple. We know that palate is completely keratinized tissue, therefore no incision is required. All you need to do is uh, drill it in. Very, very simple surgical technique. However, the gum height varies greatly from individual to individual. It varies anywhere from two millimeter all the way to 12 millimeter. So, you need to find the right location. In my experience, if patient presents with very high vault, it is very difficult to put lots of implants because t t uh, thickness of tissue is very, very great. Uh, if patient has a very high vault, I recommend just two implants uh, because uh, it's very, very difficult to put a lot of implants. But if patient has a very low vault, number one, retention is not very good on the existing denture, and you have more than enough available palate in order to place four implants, so I recommend four pallets, four palatal implants if you have a very low vault. And in order to overcome this problem, we have developed many different height of a gingival uh, gum height. And as I have mentioned, the attachment is very critical because the tongue will be very discomfortable if the attachment is very sharp. So what we, what we have developed is very low profile, yet very, re, very highly retentive uh, head design of the implant. So typically, you want to place about two to four implants on the palate in order to stabilize. And I like to avoid the midline, because on the midline, uh, there is a lot of connective tissue. So at, once again, you want to utilize the T-ruler T um, in order to guide you in the surgery uh, so that you know where the maximum amount of bone volume exists. And we typically put this T-bar 
uh, over the incisive foramen to guide us over the uh, midline so that you know where maximum amount of bone vo volume exists. Once again, this is an average amount of bone volume found in Korean, 20 Korean uh, population. Uh, so if you're Caucasian, uh, you, there will be a little bit more variation. This is also another very critical article that I want to mention. Not only is the bone volume very critical, bone density is also very critical, right? If you have a high density bone, you will achieve very excellent initial stability. And a lot of orthodontists did a lot of uh, uh, research in this area. And, and in this article, you can see that more anterior we come, uh, there is higher uh, density of the cortical bone versus more posterior you go, there is less density. Uh, but but when, if you do not get excellent initial stability on the posterior, do not worry. Just simply take it out, put the rescue implant, which is 3.5 millimeter in diameter, or simply choose another location to put additional implant. So because everybody has different height of gingival gum height, uh, what we have done is we put a kit together for you so that you don't have to uh, have a headache of choosing which implants uh, because every patient is different. We have put about 20 implants together, uh, 3.0 millimeter on the top and 3.5 millimeter on the bottom. And it also comes in different retentive caps. Uh, personally, I like to use black color because it is the most uh, less retentive. And if you put the implant exactly parallel, uh, you will probably use yellow color because uh, when the implants are pretty parallel, you will, you, you, you will not have as much retention compared to if you have two unparallel implants, uh, you will have more retention. So in those cases, you will need to use uh, least uh, retentive cap, which is black. So looking at the CT scan, please find the thickest area of the bone. And we like to use the T ruler to guide us where to put this uh, palatal implants. And I will use periodontal probe to measure the gum thickness so that my assistant can uh, select the implant size according to the gum thickness. And if you don't have a CT scan, please use this article to uh, find the thickest area of the bone. I personally do not drill, but if you have a patient who has a maxillary tori or very dense bone, I recommend you to uh, drill it. As you can see on your right, uh, it could be very easily self-driven uh, without any drilling. And once again, do not put the implant on exactly midline because uh, those are the area that uh, has the connected tissue and uh, you, uh, you will have a delayed failure if you put it on the midline. So a little bit off angle is uh, recommended. Uh, I usually use existing denture the patient has and we will uh, reline chair side in order to uh, make this more retentive for the patient. So very simple procedure. Uh, let me summarize, I know you guys are very hungry, so let me summarize my key points. Uh, number one, find the thickest bone volume through a CT scan, and if possible, try to do bicortical fixation. Number two, choose appropriate gingival thickness so that, so the implant does not stick out too much. If the implant is sticking out too much, then it will be impossible to remove the denture once you reline chair side because of undercut. Uh, undercut will prevent the uh, uh, reline material to give. So please submerge the implant completely under the gingiva. And if the, if the implant is uh, submerged too deep, uh, two weeks later you will not find the implant. So please uh, choose the appropriate gum height. Number three, denture should be fairly accurate. It should not be uh, very mobile because these implants are very small uh, and this implant only helps in retention, not to support the whole maxilla, but just for the retention. So you need, I call this implant assisted denture. It's not implant supported. So, so accurate uh, impression 
and accurate denture is very important so that you don't overload uh, this small uh, mini implant. These are only to increase, increase the retention value and it's not to support and it's not to uh, bear the uh, occlude the force. And if you do not have a lot of uh, good stability, consider using 3.5 millimeter implant as a rescue implant and always try to uh, put the implant far apart as possible in order to get the tripod uh, effect. Now, our palatal stabilizer has uh, many benefits. Once again, it's a knife threaded design to resist the lateral force and increase the bone to implant contact. It has a very low profile so that the patient has an excellent comfort and it is a self-tapping, which means surgery is super, super easy. All you need to do is just screw in. And if you have a lot of resistance, I recommend uh, going counterclockwise and clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise in order to uh, self-engage. Uh, if you have a lot of resistance, uh, especially in male patients with very dense bone, I recommend uh, taking, a, taking out the implant and pre-drilling with 1.4 millimeter twist drill, which is indicated uh, for the 3.0 implant and 2.0 drill for the 3.5 millimeter implant. So if you want happy patients, I think minimally invasive approach is, is the way to, to do. And this is a patient that we, we ah, line. She had a very loose denture. Yeah, she said uh, even her boyfriend will be very happy, but I did not charge for the boyfriend. Uh, I hope to see you next year in Thailand. And I would like to also invite you to Harvard University. Uh, we have uh, four days of evidence-based uh, uh, dentistry seminar plus a cadaver workshop in, in April. So uh, we do this every year, and this is our third uh, annual meeting. Uh, it's a great, uh, great uh, seminar. So I, I would like to invite you to our, my university. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the time in Jeju Island. Thank you very much.